Hello everyone, it is Melanie Lightbeam from Lightbeam's Treasures, and guess what? I am going to do another moment of my great moments in literature. This is a segment where I read from my personal collection or some of the books that I acquire, and my latest book is actually a signed copy. The book is called, and I'll show this to you, How Come They Always Had the Battles in National Parks? A Factual and Funny Survey of American History from the Beginning Through the Civil War by Peter Bales, Ph.D., with illustrations by Ryan Bales. So let me show you that. How come they always had battles in national parks? This happens to be a signed copy. I'll show you what he looks like. That's Peter's Bales. He was from um, Long Island, where I grew up. And look, he signed this. It says, Best to Melanie. Peter Bales, and this was on April 9th, 2010. So, if you notice something, once again, it is crisp and clean. I have never read or opened up this book. I just took it off my shelf, and I decided this would be a great opportunity to read to you. So, how come they always had the battles in national parks? And what's great about this is this is going to be a true story. So, let's start off with a preface. One afternoon, I was strolling with a small gaggle of friendly strangers up a hill known as Little Round Top, listening to a vulnerable tour guide pontificate on the nearly 150-year-old Battle of Gettysburg. When we paused and were asked if we had any questions, one yearnest young woman raised her hand, stopped chewing her gum, and queried, how come they always had battles in national parks? I laughed. I covered it with a cough when I realized she was serious and the rest of the group was actually waiting for an answer. Our tour guide, a gray-haired man with a handlebar mustache and thick glasses, 32-year-old veteran of the National Park Services who knew everything there was about the Civil War and then some, stared wide-eyed and opened his mouth. But he could not bring himself to speak and the only sound that escaped was a low moan. He placed both his hands around his stomach, bent over slightly, and appeared to be suffering from some sort of gastric distress, to which I thought to myself he was quite entitled. I stepped forward to diffuse the awkward moment. It's an incredible coincidence, I announced. All those battles in the national parks were just a coincidence and very convenient. Everyone nodded and seemed satisfied. I turned, placed my arm around our guide, and nudged him forward. He blinked a few times, glanced around to get his bearings, and a few seconds later, we were all back to normal. Why must we ask ourselves, how can so many Americans be so confused about U.S. history? Why is it so difficult for many of us to distinguish between George Washington, the president, and George Washington, the bridge. Why is the name Britney Spears more readily recognized than Franklin Roosevelt? Where did we go wrong? When it came to study American history, we took ourselves too darn seriously. That's what happened. Too many of our grade school teachers made us memorize state capitals and dates of war, and it turned us all off. In truth, history is about people and about how they used to live and why we live the way we do today. And because people are always good and bad, sensible and silly, so is history. There have been lots of laughs in history. Sometimes we have to laugh because, to paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, it hurts too much to cry. This book is a tongue-in-cheek but true survey of historical events that begin to raise the boring black veil off of our heritage. As we navigate the new millennium, it's more important than ever to understand where the heck do we come from? Why not have a good time doing it? The following pages will not explain in excruciating detail the intricate ebb and flow of our nation's past, but they will make you smile and say, hmm. And reading this may make you curious enough to delve deeper into those battles that took place in the national parks. Chapter One, A New World and a New Life or, hi, we're neighbors, now get out. 
The discovery of America came about as the results of the Old World, the Crusades, the Renaissance, and the rise of national states ruled by an absolute monarchs with money to burn. By the late 1400s, Western Europe was primed to pull a Star Trek and go boldly where no one has gone before. Great Britain founded 10 colonies along the northern Atlantic seaboard and carved three more from territory alone from the Dutch. These English colonists soon found out that life in the wilderness presented new and different challenges, such as tea time interrupted by the charging moose. And there's a uh, picture. I'll show you what it looks like. It's a Christopher Columbus discovery, and it says, Boy, I'm sure glad he discovered us. I didn't even know that we existed. The Age of Exploration. Or, I thought you knew where we were going. With all due respect to the Flintstones, tens of thousands of years ago, the Ice Age primitive hunters and gatherers crossed a land bridge from Asia into what is today Alaska. Supposedly, they were chasing a woolly mammoth, though it was more likely that the woolly mammoth was chasing them. Some of these Native Americans got sore feet and decided to settle in North American in small scattered tribes. Others trekked south and developed complex societies such as the Incas in Peru, the Mayas in Central America, and the Aztecs in Mexico. In those places, they built large stone cities, developed advanced agricultural techniques, engaged in commerce, and studied mathematics, and it made darn sophisticated astronomical observations. The Aztecs practiced human sacrifice so gruesome that even Freddy Krueger would have been grossed out. The Incas built suspension bridges, which centuries later influenced the design of the Brooklyn Bridge. They even had toll collectors. They probably also had con men who tried to sell those bridges to the less intellectual in Incas. By some weird coincidence, both the ancient Aztecs in Mexico and the Egyptians in North Africa shared such thing as pyramids and sun worships. Some people believe that the lost continent of Alaska sank to the ocean but sent out ships at the last moment. Others think flying saucers visit both places and spread ideas around. Then again, some people do see Elvis at their local Burger King. The first Europeans to discover America were the Vikings. Around 1000 CE, Leif Erikson spent a miserable winter in what is called Newfoundland. His fellow barbarians called him Leif the Lucky, but his stay in the New World was anything but. Unfriendly Indians constantly attacked, giving the Norse bullies a dose of their own medicine. So finally, Leif and company said the hell with it and returned to Greenland. The Vikings called the natives Skreglings, which loosely translate to mean buttheads. This ignagamous and brief experience with the indigenous population frequently results in the Vikings' heroic achievements being overlooked. The Vikings also rarely get credit for wearing animal skins, leather helmets topped with bullhorns, and pointed breastplates for over thousands of years before Madonna made her first video. The Middle Ages is frequently divided into the Dark Ages after the fall of Rome in 476 CE to 1000 CE, and the High or Late Middle Ages to about 1400 CE. Supposedly, conditions began to improve in the High Middle Ages, but this is all relative. If you consider that during the High Middle Ages, one quarter of European populations succumbed to the Black Death and add that to the hundred years of war between France and England, the earlier Dark Ages must have been really the pits. Anyway, in 1295, an Italian adventurer named Marco Polo returned from a remarkable overland trip to China with cargoes of silk, spices, perfumes, and takeout food. Just kidding. By the way, in modern times, Marco Polo is commonly remembered as the name of the childhood game in swimming pools, a connection which is incomprehensible. In the age before refrigeration and Ziploc bags, spices made it a little easier to gag down food that was invariably rancid. And medieval nobility needed the perfumes desperately because, fr quite frankly, they all smelled. Back then, refusing to bathe was a considered a sign of wealth and leisure. Many aristocrat bred have never taken a bath in their lives, and when their wives contrived to walk ten paces behind their husband, it was mainly to keep them upwind. 
Soon, Europeans were paying through the nose for the treasures of the Far East, and Italian trading cities such as Venice, Genoa, and Milan grew rich, functioning as middlemen and jacking up the prices. Their customers, the Northern Europeans, soon longed for a cheaper route to the treasures of the Far East. Europe in the 1300s began to enjoy the Renaissance that started in Italy. Hard to believe that if you've ever seen Tony Danza in a serious role. Renaissance means rebirth, and it's now how we feel for the first three minutes when we try to get back to jogging. It was a time when many people realized how incredibly stupid they were, so they re rediscovered the virtues of classical Greco-Roman civilizations, began to emphasize the reason and non-religious aspects of life, and generally acted like they were really cool. By the 1400s, most educated Europeans had finally figured out that, duh, the earth was round. One person pretty sure that the earth was round was Christopher Columbus, and in 1492, he decided to sell the ocean blue to prove it, but he needed money first. Chris Christopher Columbus was an Italian by birth, but since the country of Italy did not even exist yet, he asked Spain's King Fernandin and Queen Isabella to pick up the tab. They were about to send him a package when he mentioned that there must be loads of gold on the other side of the ocean. Suddenly, the king and the queen became like the doorman of Wizard of Oz, who shouted, That's a horse of a different color! After 70 days at sea, Columbus men were plotting to throw him to the sharks when just in the nick of time, the lookout, named Rodrigo, became the first person to cry land ho and actually meant it. Others have probably called land ho as a joke, but it would have been funny at first, but increasingly annoying as weeks turned into months. Rodrigo was especially psyched because Columbus had promised a reward for the first person who spotted land. Unfortunately, Captain Chris claimed he himself had spotted land the night before and kept the reward for himself. What a nice guy. Columbus, Columbus never stopped believing that he reached the island outpost of China, when in reality he landed on El Salvador and then explored the Bahamas, Cuba, Santo Domingo. He called the natives Indians, thinking that he'd reached the Indies or Indonesian islands, causing the problem we have today when people tell you that they're Indian. They might be from the country of India or Native Americans, but you never know for sure. Luckily, Columbus did not call the natives Chinese because then we would have Chinese American Indians, and while the cuisine sounds interesting, it'll be way too confusing. Keep in mind that Columbus and his men enslaved the natives and began a period in history in which the indigenous population of the Americas were decimated. In 100 years after Columbus's arrival, about 90% of the Native American population perished, mostly from European diseases. So the next day, so the next Columbus Day, don't celebrate Christopher Columbus. Commemorate him and remember everything that happened. Above all, keep your mouth shut about all this so-called overzealous government bureau bureaucracy doesn't try to take away our day off from work. So how can we live in the United States of America and not the United States of Columbus? The word America is believed to be in honor of Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci. Vespucci supposedly reached the New World in 1497, five years after Christopher Columbus. The difference was Vespucci knew he had reached a new world, while Columbus thought he was in Asia. And Vespucci quickly published an account of his exploits, proving that even 500 years ago, it was paid to have a good press agent. Most of his contemporaries thought he was nuts, but in 1519, Ferdinand Magellan set out with several ships from Spain to attempt to first circumnavigate the entire world. Magellan's expedition succeeded and will always be remembered, though Magellan himself probably had mixed feelings as natives in the Philippine Islands were killing him. Nevertheless, the journeys of Columbus and Magellan created quite the stir, leading the Western European countries to send explorers to the New World for a variety of reasons. They wanted to seek a Northwest Passage through North America to the Far East and get rich. 
They wanted to establish claims to the new lands and get rich. Create settlements and trading posts and get rich. Four, they wanted to convert the natives to Christianity and get rich. Five, they wanted to satisfy curiosity, seek adventure, and get rich. And six, they just plain wanted to get rich. Money motivated just about all the explorers. Most of Europe back then subscribed to primogenitor. I hope I'm saying that right. Primogeniture. Primogeniture. There we go. Primogeniture. The right of the eldest son to inherit the fortune and the title of the father to the exclusion of all other children. Lots of young noblemen knew that they were cut off their will and said in effect, screw you pops, I'm going to America and make my own fortune in my way. Spain really got the jump on exploring and colonizing the new world, but then Portugal got into the act by pure luck. A Portuguese sea captain named Pedro Avaris Cabral was heading to Africa when winds blew him to the other side of the ocean where he figured he might as well claim Brazil. That's why it's really dumb to ask someone from Brazil if they speak Spanish or worse, Brazilian. Remember, Spain settled most of Latin America, but the Pope in 1494 issued the Treaty of Torcedes, giving Brazil to Portugal, which was important at the time, even though today Tordesillas sounds like the menu item from Taco Bell. This divided the new world between Spain and Portugal and ensured that the Brazilians would forever speak Portuguese and generally act snobbish towards their neighbors. For Spain, Vasco Nunez de Balboa, no relation to Rocky, crossed the isthmus, a narrow strip of land connecting two larger bodies and a difficult word to pronounce quickly without spitting of Panama, to its western edge and waded into the waves of Pacific Ocean. He was not particularly impressed and misnamed the South Sea because in Panama, the Pacific Ocean often appears to be facing south. Ponce de Leon discovered Florida and wandered around drinking water from every stream and puddle and peeing behind every bush, hoping to find the fountain of youth. All he ended up was a lot of gray hair and a severe case of dysentery. Ironically, today many old people still trek to Florida if not to find their youth, or at least a little sun and maybe some shuffleboard. The Spanish call their explorers conquistadors, which means conquerors. And that alone ought to give you the idea of the attitude that they had toward the indigenous population. Hernando Cortes looted and destroyed the Aztec Empire from 1519 to 1521, and Francisco Pereiro did the same thing to the mighty Incas in Peru about a decade later. Obsidian swords and spears were really gorgeous. Castel feather fe fanheads dresses provide no match for iron muskets and cannons. The Aztecs had never seen horses before, so when they saw a Spaniard sitting on one, they thought it was an entirely new and weird type of creature. They also thought if they, they gave Cortes and his men a lot of gold and precious stones, they would be satisfied and go away. This was roughly analogous to giving hungry fat people a wagon load of Twinkies. Of course the conquistadors were hungry for more. The Aztecs were confused about a lot of things. Before he conquered them, they allowed Cortes into their midst because they thought he was a god. They changed their minds when they spied on him and noticed that the great Cortes squatted to go to the bathroom just like everyone else. But by then, it was too late. One of the cruelest conquistadors was Hernando de Soto, who from 1539 to 1542 marched from Florida westward and discovered the Mississippi River. He was hugely disappointed because he did not find any of the gold he was looking for. He expressed his frustrations by attacking every Indian village he came upon, even those that he tried to be nice. Francisco Carrado heard rumors of seven cities of gold, but after tramping through American Southwest for a few years, he only found seven cities of squat. Particularly horrible for the Native Americans was the Ecomienda system, which was instituted by the Spanish colonial government from the 1500s to the 1700s. Spanish colonies were given the right to force labor out of Indians living off their land, resulting in conditions that were far worse than any Kathy Lee Gifford sweatshop. 
It was not long before Spani Spanish treatments of the Indians had given birth to what was known as the Black Legend. This legend states that all Spaniards did was torture and murder the Indians. They steal their riches, infect them with European diseases, and basically screw things up wherever they went. Um, it's all true, but there's a but here. The Spanish intermarried with the Indians and gave birth to Matizo, people of mixed European and Indian ancestry. They also bequeathed language, culture, and Roman Catholic religion, a conglomeration which to this day is unique and independent nations of Latin America. And don't forget, there are many Spanish missionaries who, while laboring to convert the Indians to Christianity, also labored tirelessly to promote their welfare. True, the natives were generally forced to convert, but many of them were willing since their own pantheon of God had let them down and allowed their world to be turned upside down. Centuries later, Jose Feliciano would record and make a fortune with his song entitled Feliz Navidad. It's all connected. When the King of France heard that the Pope's Treaty of Torcidias had divided up the New World between Spanish and Portuguese, he demanded to see the clause in Adam's will that excluded his country. Probably lots of people had no idea what he was talking about, were too intimidated to say anything. But in any event, it soon became clear that France was going to get in the, on the action. In 1524, another courageous Italian seafarer hired himself out, this time to France. Giovanni de Varazzano explored the Atlantic coast of North America and sailed into New York Harbor. It wasn't named New York then, and Verrazzano didn't hang around, but he did reportedly remark to one of his men, hey, this looks like a great place for a bridge. In 1535, Jacques Cartier discovered and sailed up the St. Lawrence River. Seventy years later, Samuel de Champlain hoped to establish a new France in North America and founded Quebec. And about 70 years after that, Sieur de la Salle descended on the entire length of the Mississippi and named the territory Louisiana after King Louis XIV, who really loved memorialization, being memorialized. Despite these facts, when the Canadian national anthem is sung in French at a hockey game, many American fans have no clue what is going on. The extensive of French colonial holdings in North America never became expensively populated like other colonies. The main reason for this is that the French men who crossed the ocean were looking for beaver. Most French colonies had little interest in farming and permanently settled in the wilds of America. Their scheme was to trap or trade with the Indians for lots of furs, getting rich, and then return home to France. It seems the New World wasn't good enough for the French, and even back then, and that goes a long way towards explaining the snobby Parisian waiters American tourists encounter today. So I'm going to end here. That was only a small portion of Chapter 1. This is going to be a very extensive book. So I read the first seven pages. Tomorrow, we're going to start with Here Comes the British, or come on, everybody, just speak English. I hope you enjoy the book. Once again, the book is called How Come They Always Had the Battles in National Parks. It's by Peter Bales. And like I said, this was a signed copy. Really excited about that. If you enjoy my reading, please give a thumbs up. Write a comment below if you have any books you think that I should be reading. Would love to hear about that. But stay tuned for Chapter 2 tomorrow as we read more of how they come how come they always had the battles in national park until then this is melanie with lightbeams treasures take care and have a great day